you started this craze of being basically bodybuilders in rugby players' bodies. Like this, that, you started that. This, I remember because the scrum went well against it. Yeah. On, uh, in that 36 nil, you know, and there was props. Sometimes you come off and think, oh, scrum went all right. And you think, well, that's not really going to cut it, is it? <laughs> You're sitting, in, sitting in the change room afterwards and they're, everyone's like, well, scrum went well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he clipped me on the chin, sat me on my backside, and I sort of got up and that was the end of the day. You were mates. And you went on to play with some of them, didn't you? In, with with Backies. In, in, in how hard's hard Backies? I think he's all blown. No. <laughs> I reckon. Welcome to the second episode of the Rugby Pod Beyond Expected series, presented by Asahi Super Dry, official beer of Rugby World Cup 2023. In this series, we'll be talking to legends of the game as they tell stories from their career, the unexpected moments on the pitch, the surprising connections, friendships, and post-match beers shared off the pitch. Next up, we're delighted to be joined by a man who famously dismantled a Wallaby scrum in 2007 to help England reach the unlikeliest of World Cup finals. Former England front row Andrew Sheridan. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to have you in the studio. Just look at us, just three, and you Andy Rowe, three former athletes still looking athletic. Well no, let's look at Sherry, that's what we should look like. I look like a bag of rubbish, you look like a bag of bones. You're, you're a bag of bones, Yeah. and there's a man that still trains harder than hard. Well you say that. Let's do talk about to, Big Scar. Do I have to show my arm? Yeah, yeah you've got to show your arm. They can't see it. We'll oh, talk right. through it. Some people will see it. talk through it, right. Hell of a scar on your arm. That's a fresh one. Yeah, so I was doing some, still trying to lift, doing my deadlifts. That's a deadlift, Andrew, where you pick yeah. up a heavy bar. I know about it now, James. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I've been doing Sorry, those. he knows he trains now. And about, yeah, five and a half weeks ago, I was going for a decent weight, and then it, the bicep snapped off the tendon. And, Oosh. And it sh shoots up the arm. I don't know if you've ever seen like those. They call it Popeye. Yeah. Um, it shoots up the arm. And uh, it's best to have it reattached. Otherwise, it's... Uh, so I did. Two days later, I went into surgery and they reattached it. And hopefully, I'll be back. Well, I'm lifting little little dumbbells now, but that's about that's about it. Your little dumbbells are like 40 kilo dumbbells, though, right? No, I'm curling about five kilos. <laughs> Andrew, that, what's wrong with that? No, well, nothing. Nothing, nothing, no. What, what was the weight? What yeah. was the deadlift weight? Well, it was. I was trying to go for three oh five. Three oh five. But on a normal deadlift bar, but I'd only got to. So I'd been building up for a number of weeks, and then it was on. It was actually two eight five, and and it was just you just hear a pop. And it's, yeah. Pain? No, it's more of a tearing no. sound. He's, He's a Londoner, mate. He's, He's, He's a no. Londoner. No, no, it was. It was. Yeah, I've got video of it. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Not great. It just it tears off the bone, and then you don't really feel a lot after that. And then you have surgery in France and they reattach it to your ankle. Yeah, I did a great... <laughs> <laughs> Very good old was... no, they, they did a good job. In France, really, you had yeah, it done. He did a really good job. It's, they got a military hospital oh, in right. Toulon and it was uh, fantastic. I can't fault it because it's moving you know, really pretty well. Um, to, be, to be fair to France, though, that is one thing that I played in France. Jim kind of played in France, didn't you? You're a bit critical of France, aren't you? Always, yeah. mate. You're, you're, we don't like the French. We love not, the French. We hate the French. No, let Sherry go. Go on. They're not big fans of you. You've got like a love-hate. I think hate, they hate me. More hate relationship. Yeah, I think they hate me. What? Oh, okay. So, so is, are you feeling that in, in France? I've, just, just kind occasionally, of when I've seen various back and forths you've had with French supporters. You, yeah. You seem to like winding them up. Yeah, wow. Well, it's the English way, isn't it? Not I have just, a French friend now. Not just French supporters. Mr. Sheridan, not 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 just French, like all supporters, all referees. No, not all referees. All coaches. I have a French friend. I'm appreciating this uh, respectful Mr. Sheridan. But it, you're looking so, great. He's scared. Great. That means he's scared. Yes, exactly. I, when yeah. I played against Sherry, I mean, he will remember me sending one through, not on you, but like sending the weight through on the screen. So it's all. <laughs> I think you used to do both, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that was it. I didn't Sponge Fist was his nickname, wasn't it? Yeah. No, he was. He was reasonably tough I thought thanks mate Look, there we go see, what's happened to you Mr Sheridan and he's calling me Mr <laughs> Tough I know bag of bones sorry go on the French I, got, no, I do have a, a French friend now Mathieu Ray now he's my friend because I stuck up for him for his decision last year mm. so but you're right Sherry I don't think they like me I enjoyed my time in France but going back to I'm talking to French up here because had you have done that injury in deepest darkest Wales where you've been mm. you've, obviously the missus is from there you spend a bit of time there yeah. or in England you bought them the queue on the NHS, aren't you? Or you're buying it, it private? It would have been a few weeks. And it's one of those injuries that needs to be reattached quickly because otherwise it just curls up your arm. And 
It's a ball of scar tissue yeah. and you're struggling. It's a fair play to the French. They've got a great medical system, James. Mm. And I'm trying yeah. to buy some friends here as we head out they to have, France in yeah. a few weeks. Yeah. Well, they have got Just in case. Friends. We might need it. <laughs> they've got defibs. You don't need that. Now. I don't need that you're anymore. Good. So Jim right. loves stats around what people lift in the gym. Oh. You mentioned your deadlift, which is ridiculous. I'm getting about 105, not 305. Jim's doing pretty well. He's doing 50s on the dumbbell 50s no 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 50 on the deadlift he's doing no no, it's on the dumbbell that's what I've told me and Sherry in a chat about it so I feel a bit embarrassed saying it live on here because people would be like I'm making it up but sorry go on add a zero add a zero anyway bench press that's the ultimate everyone considers it like how much can you bench is is something that people say it's a saying right it is really I don't know how much how how useful it is in the rugby context but but yeah, my best was 210 kilos. 210. I not, never. Do you remember the store? Go on. Sorry. Not 225 or 260 or something. It gets inflated yeah. all the time. So let's let's talk about let's go into how it all started for you. Talk to me about your your England debut because that was quite a while ago and you, there was a lot of hype around you, a lot of talk around you. Let's get stuck into that. Yeah, the the, the debut was 2004, and I'd been I'd played about 100 games before that as a second row. And so I was 23 when I moved to prop. And I remember the following year, I, I, that was my, I came off the bench against Canada, but my first time I started for England was uh, 2005. Um, and yeah, it was uh, after only a couple of years or three, two and a half years of playing prop, it was, it was a great moment. And like a lot of people say, you know, was proud to represent your country. And um, yeah, things went pretty well. Well, the interesting thing was, Cher and I have played against each other and with each other for, I remember him, I reckon about 14, 15, 16, Dulwich College. Really? He was a number eight. And he was about that big as a 15, 16 year old. Not uh, that tall. You were that tall. Maybe not as stacked because he's been eating weights for years, but he was massive back then. He used to pick the ball off off the back of a scrum and run a, I was a skinny little fly off at the time with a little pot belly. (laughs) Truth. (laughs) And I'm like, who is this monster? <laughs> he used to sh- scare the shit out of people at number eight. And then obviously we played England 16s and 18s yeah. and then he and then started moving to second, second row. row. And then, I'm like, how about lifting that one, boys? Yeah. And I didn't have a great deal of interest in line outs. Yeah. Just got, I wasn't that good at jumping. And I didn't like all the calls and all the dancing around that you have to do in line outs. <laughs> but but this is the thing. So who, who, was his, who was his line out partner? And I wasn't much good at taking kickoffs. Oh, so, that's a hard skill. Yeah. <laughs> so we had all these factors counting against me, and then I was just—I carried the ball a bit, and a lot. Then, but then the uh, the propping was more of a, a natural sort of progression. So you say natural progression. You've moved like if you're moving through the gears of I'm going to say pain, but also specialization. Yeah, well done. Yeah, said it. Said it all in one. From eight to second row, and then you're moving up into the front row. Like uh, you see the flankers potentially do that, but you very rarely see someone going through the gears. I'm just trying to think. I had a mate, Matt Parr, the great Matt Parr. You would have heard of him, everyone. But I played for England back when I was England and English. In yeah, back when I was English you years were, ago, you I was in the English. second row. You are England, and he moved up. He transitioned. I mean, something very different now. But he yeah. transitioned <laughs> to loose and did really well. Played for Sale, played for Leicester a few games. But to do what you did, to go through the gears of from eight to second row to become, in your heyday, one of the greatest losers, but also changing the profile of what props look like. You started this craze of being basically bodybuilders in rugby players' bodies. Like this, that, You started that. Do you know that? Is that right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. go that far. It's a compliment. Yeah. It's a compliment. Oh, Another compliment, you, Mr. Sheridan. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sheridan. <laughs> <Hampton. You're very laughs> it was, yeah, it was very tough moving from second row to prop that late on. Um, because there is a lot. It's not just, oh, can you lift this weight or do this? There's a bit more to it and the the testing nature of the position. From, it's easier if you move a bit earlier, at 23 or whatever I was. It was, uh, yeah, it was, I was pretty inconsistent. You have got have one good game, one good scrum, a couple of bad ones, and fortunately they sort of stuck with me at, at Bristol at the time and and then it sort of went on from that. And when you wake up in the morning... And you're a second row. How did it start to go? Actually, do you know what I fancy playing Lou said? So I, I go back to you played with Tom Youngs a lot. Yeah. And I, yes. I remember Youngs, he, he was an inside centre, and we're watching a Tuesday morning brawling mm-hmm. session at Leicester. The backs are playing touch, it's pissing down the rain. And I'm, we're like cold, we're like, can we go inside and play cards or something? And he's looking at the forwards going, I want to be over there. I'd love to be involved in that. 
Um, but it's different for you because, and he goes on to be a British and Irish Lions yeah. hooker and all this stuff, and amazing player, amazing career. But you're in the second row, you're in the mix already. And what makes you think, actually, I want to make it a bit harder and put my head up someone, not up someone's ass, but in someone's face and get into the front row where it is the most uncompromising yeah. position. I, I think. think it was just that if I wanted to reach the international level, even though I went on the tour in 2000 as a second row, but that was just sort of midweek um, playing out in South Africa. But to move up to to prop was probably my best chance of making it at an international level. So you know, certain people that I was around at the time, like um, Phil Keith Roach, and, who was England scrum coach at the time, he... He was quite um, important, well, very important in making, helping me make that sort of pos positional change. But um, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy move to make. But it was one that I thought was, it was worth having a, a good go at. And if it didn't work out, then hell of a decision. Yeah, hell oh, of a decision. Well, you look at it now. <clears throat> okay, I'm I did have a stab at playing tight head the year before. That's but, where the money is. I was going to say, uh, I didn't know where that's where the money is. Or was. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I literally <laughs> went in, I, think I was against a guy called Rod Snow. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, Canadian yeah. Canadian yeah. he, was, he was a freak. Newport, Prop. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, we played Newport. I think it was a, could have been a pre-season game. I can't remember. And and he actually said, you haven't got a clue what you're doing. And I just went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that in the scrum as well? In the scrum. It was a bit more sort of colourfully put. Obviously, I'll keep this you know, good language and everything. No, you, you don't need to. No. You, could, you could have said to him, like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing, but you wait until I've got your number on the back of my jersey. I'm going on to be British and Irish guys. I'm, I'm going to single-handedly dismantle a French pack, an Australian pack, Mr. Snow. Exactly. And then, go. so at the early stage, you mentioned Rod Snow then, but playing against Grizzly Tightheads back in the day as you're a loose head. Mm. Like you'd have played against the likes of Garforth and people like yeah. that, like horrible, like amazing bloke, but yeah. his skin's fallen off his face. Uh, he's, he is proper mongrel mob, isn't he, from Cov? And but, Julian White. Julian White, yes. who, who you played with a lot at Bristol. Yeah, got on very well with him. And then we'll Don't get onto the scrap in a bit. Yeah. That was a humdinger. I was actually well, in France. It wasn't much to it. He clipped me on the chin, sat me on my backside, and I sort of got up, and that was the end of the day. But you were mates. <laughs> yeah, but he's got his. You know, There's no mates in the scrum, is there? No, it was, I wouldn't say we've got the better of them that day, but we were. He just wasn't totally. I remember it because he we wasn't that happy. I could tell he was in a bad mood. They weren't getting it all their own way. I'm not going to say we were smashing them. We weren't, but he was just. I could tell he was wound up, and he grabbed my leg, and I was sort of throwing a useless little one of those sort of flicks, and then yeah. he probably went for it, didn't he? He, yeah, was, he, a, could, he, he was a madman. He was. He, no, he's a good. He was, he's like, a great bloke. Yeah, oh, he's, he's a great. Bloke. On the fit, once you on walk pitch, over, yeah, on the once pitch, he's walk. a madman. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Hey, no. He's just got a short fuse. I'm. That's a madman. You were quite an angry. Yeah. I was, but that's Julian White's fault. He started. <laughs> it. He the stuff he used to tell me. He's like, right, if the scrum's going forward, do not stop. And I was like, Whitey, wherever you go, I'm going. And if it was stable, it'd be like you need to send one through. The call was 69 back then. We weren't mm. overly smart, but he was a strong prop though. He was mm. technically really good, and he. had Great all round sort of strength. It was perfect sort of build for a yeah, you know, very good tight head. Oh, was a lovely I thought you were about to say great all round skills as a tight head, but he used to tell me if you see me outside your goody, do not give me the ball because I can't oh, no, catch it. He wasn't it. into that. He <laughs> wasn't into that. We used to cheer him if he caught it at training, didn't we? Yeah. If he caught one, we'd be like, Whoa! the whole session would stop and erupt and he'd be running down the wing or whatever. Great bloke. No, but the props I these days are all sort of um they they're playmakers, Mark. Yeah. You've got that pod, they always put a pod and they've got to be able to tip it on or decoy and it's a bit more to it a bit, yeah you were ahead of your time mate no I didn't do any of that yeah, just ran over people yeah, you just did pick, I mean, and pick, pick and go pick and go pick and go that's coming back in as well it mm. needs to should we, should we look at the 2007 tournament yeah let's should we get it. into that because I mean yeah there's some there's some big memories from that that tournament what, when you look back at that before we dissect it what was your fondest memory from that tournament um Probably the fact that we went from, well, how can you put it, not not in a particularly good position to getting all the way through to the final. And we didn't really let ourselves down in the final either. I think South Africa were a better team. I know at the time there was all the debate with Cueto's. Try. Uh, try. Well, at the time we thought it was, but obviously it didn't count. So. He's still dying off that, Cueto's. Yeah. <laughs> it was a try though. But, uh, I wish it was. <laughs> Basically, Sherry's a World Cup winner because we'd have won had they given that try, but referee, it must have been French. Do you think it was a try? I'm, I'm going to say yes, because Quates are my mate and Sherry's here and he'll knock me out if I say no. Do you think about that or not? I know. No. 
you don't you don't ever think what if no 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 no, no it's no point is it it's uh, it's done and it's gonna move on and move forward and yeah I know, and it but... wasn't as if as I say it wasn't as if as a team or a squad we let ourselves down I mean we lost but it, at the time we had sort of had a decent sort of journey through journey I don't want to use that word journey yeah, that's great. it was that's a journey, journey. <laughs> um, path through from quarter final semi final and we put a decent run together yeah. after that initial 36 nil. well that's what I was going to ask you that first game South Africa 36 nil in Paris everyone's kind of saying oh this is you know the worst England team ever blah 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 and then to come back from that to where you got to we'll get through the story in a minute but there was loads of stuff in the press around the coaches and then there were senior players like Lowell. Shawsey was there, wasn't he? Faz was playing it yeah. in the centres. Big Faz, I'm not talking about yeah, Owen, I'm talking about Andy, who took, from what I heard, took a bit of power and it was more player-led. Go back to that 36 nil drubbing and the feeling in the dressing room afterwards and the week after that, because it's a group game, you know you've only got to finish second effectively to, to qualify. But the emotions of that to... How the change happened because it was monumental. The change from losing thirty six nil. I remember because the scrum went well against it yeah. the, in that thirty six nil. You know, and there was props. Sometimes you come off and think, "Oh, scrum went all right," and you think, "Well, that's not really going to cut it, is it?" <laughs> You're sitting, in, sitting in the change room afterwards, and there, everyone's, like, "Well, scrum went well." Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, I don't know. After I, I, I remember it as a bit. We just carried on doing our job, and then you've probably heard about that the, there was a meeting and. A, all this sort of stuff and people put things up on the flip chart or as we had back then you know, and uh tell us about that was, what, what was on the flip, flip chart? chart i'd have drawn a willy <laughs> i'd have drawn a willy and then some stuff shooting out the top that's a, that was my humor yeah i think it was more just well we wanted to find some way to salvage uh, the world cup so it was uh just trying to simplify things that's, and that's how we took it forward. I think we just kept things very simple, um, fought for every scrap of possession, made sure our set piece was great, defence was really solid. And we then had a couple of games afterwards against tough teams like Samoa and Tonga. They went all right. And then we see you suddenly find yourself in the in the quarterfinal against Australia and no one expects you to win, which is always, it's easier those, to be in those sort of games as opposed to the, you know, the team of... Well, 20 years ago now, isn't it? They were favourites in 03. And so, so when you're not favourites, you can just have, have a crack, really. And that's what I think happened in, as we progressed through the tournament. And who was leading that? So in that meeting there, and again, only going based on hearsay, mm -hmm. but you think back to 03, all the talk was it was player-led and Clive had this grand plan, but it was all the players. And you think about the profile of the players they had. Some of them, like Goody mentioned, Lawrence is a, a great one in 07. Vix as well, Skips. Yeah, Vix. And Andy yeah. Farrell, who was a born leader. Yeah. At what point did the players kind of take over without belittling the coaches that were in charge? But that's what they had in 03. Yeah, I I think I was always on the outside of these sort of things. I was not not the sort of personality who goes, right, come and listen to me. I'm, I've got the ideas. And you, you need those those people you've just mentioned to, to be the sort of figureheads and then you just get on and you need a lot of people like myself who just get on and do your job. Um, and that's really what I, you know, you let them do what they want to do. And I just got on and did, did my job. Um, so I haven't got any, and I'm sort of come on here. I've got a deep insight into that meeting for you. So no, but that's great. No, you, you, and Saki, you and Saki were sat at the back half asleep. Yeah, right? yeah, you were no, thinking scrum. Honest. Actually, on your disservice there. You'd be at the back thinking about scrum. Saki would be asleep at the back somewhere, just going, "What time just meet and finish, lol? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, I don't remember the it being completely player led. I thought they sort of the coaches were still on board with things, but I think they just had to listen to what the some of these senior players were saying. And in the wake of you know losing thirty six nil, it's and at the time there wasn't all the social media and stuff, and I I was never that sociable really anyway <laughs> we think so i wouldn't be checking everything out and it's so mental in the difference back yeah. then like social media now you would seeing have boys pulling out off, their, yeah, yeah boys pulling out the phones looking at stuff going oh fuck i better put my phone away because yeah. yeah. it's it can be harsh and i'll blame jim for that but um there was yeah. nothing back then was there's just like no. written press and no, if i were a player now like i wouldn't be um been looking up these things 
wouldn't be Googling my name or, or any of that sort of stuff because you're bound to find it's always going to be someone who's got a vendetta against yeah. you. So just concentrate on your own game and your own, the people around you, your team, your coaches, and not worry about it all. Yeah. So <clears throat> before we go to the final against South Africa, who've got history in World Cups, but also scrum time. What about Australia? So I don't want to say that you had an easier path to the final, but from a scrummaging point of view, this is no disrespect to Australia. The talking point around Australia has always been they've got a it week start, scrum. It was started by Sherry yeah. in 07, basically. I'm, build, I'm setting the scene yeah. because you don't want to be horrible, but then we have to be horrible because I think not single-handedly, but they got destroyed in 07 in the quarterfinal. And they were big favourites, weren't they? Oh, yeah. If yeah, we talk yeah. about they'd being really honest. They've been in good form, I think, yeah. from... Um, before the World Cup and you know going into the World Cup, but um, we we work well and I've always talked you know I know people say it's very kind single handedly but it, as Jim knows it's if you if if you haven't got all the components of the scrum functioning well then it's you're going to struggle it doesn't matter how strong you are as an individual prop you need to work with your hooker um, you know, you need it makes a hell of a difference if you've got a powerful second row as, as opposed to one who's more just you're the line out guru so you know you'd always fight to get the sort of simon shaw type second row or you might ensure up your ass right yeah you need that sort of power yeah um think case powerful as well but you know it's um it makes a hell of a difference what in terms of who's around you at a scrum mm. it's not just a a single man type thing it's a collective it is collective but humble yeah mm. people always think it's but it Jim, you know, look, you know, this is why second rows were not me, but were you know are paid so highly because of the line out function and the power. Bend over scrum. and push, and like even now, it's almost like oh, the scrum. We you were talking about the the props being able to play. You think of the final in 2019, the scrum yeah. dominance that South Africa had mm. that won them the game, that gave them the platform. So you're right when you say that. It's for people watching this and yeah. and who have watched you or haven't watched you and as we're mm -hmm. talking about scrums what does it feel like when you go through like a, a warm knife through butter because that's what it looks like just kind of describe if you can go through the nostalgia and the archives of how it feels being in that scrum when it's dominant yeah. it's it's a fun part of the game i know hey i know you're not going <laughs> to agree with that. I, agree. I love the scrum it is when you but it's a horrendous part of the game when you're on the back foot when it rolls are reversed so but it is um you know that if you can get some real impetus in the scrum and dominate that those sorts of scrums it seems to have a knock-on effect on other areas of the game you then seem to be a bit more aggressive in defense you dominate collisions more um i know we watch you know you see some of the scrums and you think god how long is this scrum going to take to get through or, and people get fed up with them and with some justification but they, it's still a critical part of the sport and I still, it's one of the few areas I still really like watching Yeah, when you've got a really good battle going on. I love it. I generally love it. I used to love it actually when you're playing, mainly because I was at Leicester and we had a dominant scrum most games. So all the backs running and fucking slapping the tight heads and the loose heads on the back, whooping and hollering. But you're right, it gives you energy, doesn't it? Like yeah. if you've got a dominant scrum, I remember times when I'd play at other clubs and I'd be like, we are getting absolutely hosed today because our scrum is in reverse. And we've got props getting our brown wings which is head up your own ass kind of thing. And yeah, like the energy, it's an energy giver for the team, isn't yeah. it? So exactly. it does show how it, it really it is. is. And also it's, you've got to be a special kind of breed to be in that front row. I don't know whether you were this kind of player show. I'm going based on Julian White, Graham Roundtree, Garth Forth, right. Cockrell, where we're out in whatever bar in Leicester and you just look, you can see all the heads of everyone, but the front row are down there scrummaging at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it, it, you, that was your era where they were doing that. Were you watching that or were you a part of it? Um, I, I remember having lunch with um, Phil Keith Roach, scrum coach. Great black, eh? Yeah, we were at a steakhouse, really good guy, you know, but, but he had his knife and fork and he was like designing a scrum with knives and forks <laughs> and cutlery. And then he'd be up, standing up, in you know, the middle of the afternoon, and he said, "You've got to go like this, boy, like this." And uh, and you see all these people, and it was it was in uh, uh, gout shows, or something like the restaurant, the state restaurant. And they're like, "What? What is, what is going on?" Because <laughs> he's quite a bit older than me. And, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the two of us just talking like this, and they're just looking across and thinking, "What are these blokes doing?" And 
But it's just, yeah, you sort of live and breathe scrums when you're in that front row, I suppose. I reckon you've got a tattoo that says scrum is life or something like that. You got, no. No? no? No, 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 I don't. You'd have that, wouldn't no. you, Jeff? I, well, if you were Sherry, you'd have scrum is life somewhere on your... It'd be one of my best tattoos. With your chateaus. Them, absolutely shocking. Going back to, obviously, Australia, the Australia game, you talk about your front row and your hooker and um, the relationship you have there and working together. And I know your character. You're quite a... Uh, you, you're not an out there kind of character, are you? You're someone who does your work, yeah. gets on with their business. You know, you, you're not looking to say, "Look at me, look at me." Mm-hmm. And Vix is very similar to you, isn't he? In the way he was at times, a little bit more comes he's, out of him. Yeah, he's, he was a good leader, and yeah. he would stand and speak. So he spoke well, you know, before games, and yeah, but still quite quiet in many respects. But then you get in the middle, and you've yeah. got the biggest clown but one of the greatest, funniest blokes you've ever met in your life in Mark Regan. Yeah. Polar opposite characters to you, with all due respect, in, yeah. a, in a positive way. Like, go back to those scrums when you were dominating Australia. He must be chirping like hell, right? Oh, he was non-stop. <laughs> non-stop. But he was a really good, technically strong scrummaging hooker. And he, he sort of knew, it just, it just seemed to, we worked well together. As a loose head, I, you always want the hooker to look after your right, shoulder a little bit so that the tight heads can't split the two of you and he was great at blocking tight heads and he was just a I know he's always got this image of being a bit of a joker but he was he was super serious when it came yeah. to uh, scrummaging and yeah he was, and then we had also I think at the time George Shooter was a good scrummager as well so the two of them um yeah set the set a good sort of uh scrummaging uh set up for us he's been cancelled now Mark Regan hasn't he has he? He's been well, yeah. Like that's the well, whole thing. Just being, he's loose, isn't he? Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's loose. He's brilliant, Rex. Oh, yeah. Ronnie, he, like, some of he, his how one-liners. Do follow, how do you follow him? Some of his one-liners. I mean, you must be. Cr- I don't know. Would you be cringing or laughing when he's coming out with some of the shit that he used to come I, out with? I, I, I just showed him flinch. <laughs> yeah, look, look at him. He's, <laughs> he's like that. I was not never, flinching. I was never a fan of all that sort of. You know, you gather around, everyone just big scrum. You know, got to go forward, got to make the hits. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, that's what you got to do, haven't you? Yeah. you like, as in, when I look at Sherry, and I'm not spent a huge amount of time with playing against you, but like looking through the archives, you are the like, as in, you have Lawrence Delalio, who's an alpha, and we've had Lawrence in loads of different scenarios. I've spoke to him in the studio and stuff like that. There's a kind of energy, like of alpha, at least. But you've got the same because it's like, just you don't need to say, you don't, you don't need to say anything. You have these different characters of just like. You don't need to be all guns blazing. Yeah, all noise. You just be like, nah, just do your job. Just fucking get on with it. You yeah. know, like we can get out there and we're just going to do it, and yeah. then we'll go home at the end of it. And I don't, there's not a question. It's just a, another compliment. But it leads me on to talking about France because, like, if you go back to the start of the tournament, like Goody mentioned it, and then you're up against France in the semis. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, in Paris. In Paris, home gaff for them. What's the mindset? They've just done going the All Blacks as yeah. well. Yeah. Did you watch that game as well? Because it was the best All Blacks team we've ever seen to a World Cup. Yeah, because you, yeah. Forget, because you forget. For, well, I forgot France yeah. until I went through the archives, knowing that we have, had you. Like, But then you've just mentioned it. Mm. Played The All Blacks were unbelievable, beat them. What was the mood going in? Well, they always raise their game, don't they? It seems against the All Blacks, France. But um, yeah, we, we'd we obviously played in Marseille. We're on the train straight up. And you, it just follows on so quickly that you haven't got time to overthink things, and so you just and that we did less and less uh, training as it as the tournament progressed, and so when when we were, uh, we had France up, we were just just carried carried on the momentum. So we weren't again. I didn't think there was a huge amount of need to say a lot. It was just get your get your basics right. Carry on with what we we had done well against Australia. France were going to present a bit more of a challenge in the scrum, and uh, yeah, we just cracked on with it. And on it, on it rolled. Oh, it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Like with that, they beat the All Blacks, which was the yeah. biggest shock in World Cup history, probably in Cardiff, because the All Blacks arrogant. They're they on ninety nine. Yeah, but yeah, the same yeah, well, yeah. Actually, yeah, ninety nine was probably bigger. You got a problem against the French. We did. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> first, for reminding us. First game, um, but then like in Paris, you say home semi final. Against the French, they were big favourites again, weren't they? Without yeah. sort of talking England down, it was like, geez, thirty six nil, and you get through the group. Then you beat the Aussies, and it's all Sherry Scrum and Vicks and all those boys. And then it's like, ah, France have just beaten the All Blacks. 
And again, you're saying the same thing, going under the radar, just doing your job. Mm. But the French, do you remember, was there a lot of pressure on the French then? Was it was a lot of chat in the press around, this is our time and I the French's so. time and all yeah, that stuff. It, and do you reckon I they think, undervalued you a little bit? or? Um, I think they probably thought that we'd be relatively easy to get past and they probably had all eyes on the final. Having beaten New Zealand, they're going to be thinking, right, get England out of the way and then onwards. Um, that that happens. But then also, as you say, it was, it's home home World Cup for them and it's a, a lot of pressure and they um, you've got to deal with that pressure as well. Whereas we have we were still riding that sort of crest of the wave after the uh, Australia game. So I think we played with a little bit more freedom and less pressure. I remember, was it Sebastian Chabal in that tournament specifically, I think, yeah. when he was yeah. up against Ali Williams, don't know, because they obviously mm. played the against hacker, each other yeah. in 2011. But I, I remember, I, can't, I mean, I played in the 2007, not that that's iconic at all. But I get on. Well, we we won our final against Italy in the pool stages. <laughs> <laughs> we played against Argentina, who were unbelievable. You think yeah, how good yeah. Argentina were in yeah. 2007? Yeah. Well, they beat France in the opener, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, they had uh, Hernandez, great front row. I think Montero was playing, uh, Ledesma. You're right. Exactly. Yeah, they were good. Uh, Alba set in the second row. But at France, I remember Sebastian Chabal. Mm. So when I think about French teams, I think a bit about DuPont now. But my vision of France is Sebastian Chabal. You played with him at yeah, Sale as well. What what was he like as a character? Um, he was a tremendous athlete and at his best. Oh. Uh, he could he carry the ball ferociously. He was great over the ball. He was great in de uh, defence. But he was a player who did. He wasn't someone who had a, like a work rate that went. You know, some of the some back rowers. He would do. He was like an anaerobic man. He was like burst of this and then power. Burst, yeah, and then you see him walk a bit, and you have to accept. That he'll walk a bit because he's going to, then going to do a really explosive action after after he's got his breath back, um, basically. So he was a he was a big threat around that time um, to play against, and obviously at Sale, it was great to have in the same team. Mm. Poster boys, what? Go on. I was going to say culturally at Sale, what was he like? Because Manchester's very different to. He drove a little shitty smart car. Oh, no. that shitty. I he mean, sat he, in the back, he, drove in the front, right? Before his time, electric. <laughs> he was before his time. That bloke. <laughs> Who thought a caveman would be before his time on an electric car? Because obviously with Philippe Sat Andre at Sale as well, there's a few French players yeah. there um bruno was there as well yeah and like for you as a loose head prop that you're playing with the french judge themselves on their scrum don't they yes yeah, so culturally were they great off the field as well yeah they were they you know fitted in well there was quite you know the team was quite successful at yeah. the time at sale and, yeah you fucking beat us um, in the final i scored <laughs> no it's about me i scored in that final <laughs> <laughs> julian white <laughs> latch me sorry <laughs> but no it's uh yeah, Philippe San Andre was a coach at the time, and he was big into the scrum. I think he was. Um, uh, what was the name of his? He was a big mate with a, a scrum coach. He may have been from Brief, Laurent. Oh, Laurent Sen. That's it. My old yeah. boss. He was. Mm. Thank he you, Laurent. They, all I'm saying, thank you, Laurent. Yeah. <laughs> he was. Brief, he was brief. Wasn't yeah, he, he was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so he's big into his scrum. So he's, first thing he wanted to do, he signed Bruno, who was renowned uh, scrummager, a hooker. Made sure he had a, a big pack. So that he could, you know, take on people physically in the Premiership, and you didn't have to worry about your set pieces as, as much. So, it yeah, works. but all those French guys fitted in well at Sale, and and it, yeah, it was a big big part in the success of the team. Sorry to can jump around go. a little bit. If we can go back to Chabal a little bit, um, was he as tough? Because he comes across as like the toughest guy of that era. Was 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 that what he was like as a player? Oh, he was he was. Tough and uh, physical. He had a, an amusing laugh. I don't know if you've heard him laugh because he's got like a little squeak. Yeah. And he's like this great, <laughs> he's like, -hoo -hoo. like so, and, he, and you used to see see him like this huge man with, and he had this little squeaky laugh. But no one ever obviously took the mick out of it. <laughs> no. But, uh, but he was a fierce sort of competitor. But I don't think you would have thought he was any more aggressive than a lot of the back rowers at the time. And um, he was just very explosive. Oh, aesthetically, and again, you're into your training. I know you mentioned it there, but he had like gorilla-like arms, didn't he? Long, but very muscular. And then yeah. there's the shot yeah. of him in the, well, both jerseys, where you can just see his six-pack busting through. Oh, yeah. he, he, For me, yeah. he would be like, the as in, how do you want to look, Jim? I want to look like Chevelle, please. Like, that is you going to grow dream. hair as well? I can't. Okay. No, I can't. You know that I can't. <laughs> no, he was a, a 
pretty decent athletic specimen, wasn't he? But, uh, he was ideal for the deadlift, actually, because I remember seeing him doing some deadlift with those arms. The range of movement wasn't very far, so he was like... <laughs> Up he goes. Yeah. But, yeah Scrapping? He was... Was, it, was he a scrapper or no, not? No, no, he wasn't. No. No. I, I grabbed him. In, yeah, and no. Grabbed him. The old grab Go on, go on <laughs> Jim. Grabbed, no, Did you push go him? on, Jim. Did you push him? I pushed him. That was it. <laughs> well out. He was like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who are you? And I'm like, I'm literally, <laughs> Mr. Shabbat, I am literally a nobody. I have pushed you. Compared to you, I am no one. Jim was the best pusher in Palmec. world. Palmec. Is that, is that no man? Palmec? Is that even a thing? A Palmec. Sebastian. No Palmec. man. No guy. No, no guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am Palmec. <laughs> I am no guy. My last vision, I'm, I'm, we've seen Shabbat a lot. Hong Kong, and we saw him in Hong Kong. Oh, he sold his soul. Yeah, he sold his soul. And what was I that? would walk five hundred miles. And he's trying and to sing there. that oh, yeah, in the was, smallest yeah. little outfit. He looked great, though. Yeah, skin. He sold all the tickets, and then he got done. So he's uh, he's singing songs yeah, in Hong Kong. True. And then you get through to the semi, get through that game. Yeah. And then the be- the build up to the final. Yeah, it's just it, it then becomes dawns on you that what. People was looking around. What's going on here? You know, we've we've gone from thirty six nil. You know, one of the worst England teams in memory, really. I think at the time that's what we were thought of. And suddenly you find yourself in the in the final against South Africa, and and there was all to play for. You just go go out there and mm. give it our best. Hence why we got you on beyond expected, mm. because it was. I remember, and again going back over it, and you speak to loads of people about it. It was like England came from nowhere. And they've got history in World Cups. Mm. 2019, arguably, you could say the same. But that 2007, no one, no one saw England get to the final. And well, even before the tournament or... I, I just think yeah, in I general, know. I just think when I think through it, because of mentioned Australia were, yeah. were going really well, All Blacks as well. It was in France. Yes. Like There was a number of reasons why. Like Argentina, what they did at the beginning of the tournament. So as it kind of built, and like, I think you've referenced it, not that you would have lost against Samoa and Tonga, but they're tough games to get through, yeah. uninjured especially. Yeah. And then you look at then the makeup, like playing against Australia, one of the favourites, France in France. And when you actually outlay it like that, you're like, how have England made it to the final for a, well, it's a one-off game, a shootout. Just give us a bit more in, in, in the build-up of how Well, that, we, that I was. think those games that you just mentioned, they sort of, we've become a bit battle-hardened. So... Sometimes you can, I know there's a lot of talk about playing too much rugby, but sometimes when you just have game after game after game, you haven't got time to get, I, I found and from my point of view, you haven't got time to get too nervous about what's ahead of you because you're just into that cycle of game after game. Um, and that's what happened with their team as a whole. We had this sort of, I think you had batten, batten down the hatches, battle hard and and just get on and do do your own jobs. And we didn't have, it wasn't, I think I've talked about it earlier, it wasn't a great deal of a chat about everything. It was just get our training done, get do the media, whatever you have to do, and then and then just crack on and don't don't let all the hype that surrounds a World Cup get on top of you. Yeah. Try to keep us, you know, keep away from it a little bit, which was easier, like we talked about uh, back then, because you haven't got your phones constantly yeah, yeah. beeping at you, telling you, telling you that you're useless and... Well, you weren't useless at that point. It was like useless after thirty-six nil. Let's get onto yeah. that bit because obviously you're back in the final against South Africa, who had dusted you thirty-six nil in the opening game. Now, yeah. was there much chat about that, like retribution, or was it like we're a whole different team at the minute compared to where we were at? Yeah, no, it was. I think that was forgotten about. I would probably if I can't speak for the South Africans, it's probably more difficult for them to. Yeah. They think, well, smash, them. smash these guys thirty-six nil. This should be a uh, a pretty easy, easy game, and then so it's probably mentally it might have been, I wouldn't say tougher for them, but more complicated. Um, but f- but for us, it was just we're here now, so you know, let's make a better fist of it than we did in the pool stage. Yeah, probably. and Johnny Wilkinson obviously drops the goal no three to win it. It's the next World Cup. You know, there was no chat about Jono retiring, Backy, and all these boys. You had a few boys there like Lol and yeah. Um, yeah, Catty was there as well, wasn't Jason he? Robinson, Jason Robinson. Yeah. So there was a, a bit of a crossover. But talk to me about Johnny Wilkinson because you're, as we said earlier, you're someone that doesn't like to be front and centre of talking about everything and revving the team up. Other people did that. But Johnny wasn't like that either, was he? He wasn't, but it was something that he developed as his career went on. And certainly at Toulon, he was um, yeah. more vociferous in terms of 
you know, in the change room talking more and more. But he, he was someone who just, as you well know, locked himself away training hours and hours on the, just practicing his kicking. Um, probably same as you probably put the work in yeah. as well, didn't you? Yeah, I did. He was kicking. <laughs> I was in the pub. I think, I think that was a different They were up to the same time. Yeah. But he was, um, wow, well, a lot's been said about him. Single-minded, very focused on on everything to do with the game. You know, every minute sort of detail, detail he was uh, on top of. Mm. But you're looking around that week. Are you drawing on the experiences of those guys from 03 or was it just a completely different team and it wasn't talked about? Because there's loads yeah. of narratives that you can build up in a game, isn't there? Yeah, I think I, I don't think 03 was talked about uh, much, but obviously those guys who had that experience from 03, they, they obviously, that obviously helped with the whole dynamic of the group. Um, and then you had younger guys, um, with people like Matthew Tate coming mm. through, who Did really was well, in great, great form. And I think when you're a bit younger, I wasn't that young at the time. I don't know, I was 27 or something. But you've got the younger guys coming through as well. And they're, they're as you find, more fearless when it yeah. comes to the, some some of these big occasions. And so you had that nice blend of the experience from 03 and the sort of the youth guy, youthful guys coming through as well. And, and that created a good balance, I think, in the end. Mm. What about running out? In the final then, into the stadium, the hysteria around that, Tr try and set the scene with your family there, with your mates, like what was the, the build up for you in, personally? Um, it's just, it's, they're massive occasions, aren't they? Obviously you sort of walk in, they, you walk out and, but before you know it, you, you get through the anthems. Yeah. I'm not sort of building this up too well, Jim, am I? No, go on, build it up. Well, just, well you're, you're not the character that's bothered by that stuff, but like Vix was yeah. leading us out, I say us, <laughs> I felt like I was there. But and he looked emotional, didn't he? Yeah, he. I used to find him quite motivating. Yeah, when he spoke to the group as a whole, he used to really speak from the heart. And um, whilst I wasn't a great fan of these sort of Churchillian type speeches, it felt like he really, really meant it when he was talking. And so he did rev up the sort of the emotions of, of everyone. And that was um, so you had those sort of people who could do that, and then you fed off that without necessarily jumping up and down and. Mm doing the same sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you think with Vix though, he felt he knew the enormity mm -hmm. of winning a World Cup. So you think from the crossover of them players in 2003 to have done what they did. Well, no one had been back to back, had they? Well, even back to back, but you think from winning a World Cup, how it affected their lives and the feeling of doing that. And you know, we've won things before, but it's not a World Cup. So for Vix, with the emotion that he's got, and the feeling of knowing what it actually feels like and what it takes to win a World Cup. You can imagine the emotion, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. probably why yeah. he was like that. And not coming towards... Well, he was coming towards the end mm. in terms of that. Yeah, last couple, couple of years. years. Last yeah. couple of years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Until he did the beast in South Africa. A couple <laughs> <of> years later. <laughs> Until he got beasted. You know? No, he did the beast in the third test. Mm. So I remember he came up and he was like... Bleh. No, he won't. No, he got beasted. He got beasted in the first one, I think. But then first he... test, the scrum didn't go particularly well. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say he beasted the beast. He the did in that third test. I think he, he held his own. The, the third test went better in. The yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember Vix coming off the field going beast. <laughs> and we lost the series already, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, and that game, World Cup final, then it was a bit of a cagey game, wasn't it? Obviously, they got Percy Montgomery kicking goals and. Yeah, there's the Mark Cueto instant. Tatey made the break, and yeah. it was an edgy game. It was uh, a typical sort of final, wasn't yeah. it? Wasn't emotionally. I mean, you're not a guy that goes high highs on emotions and low lows, probably. But did you get nervous? Were you? Did you feel the edge around everything, or were you just where's the next scrum? A little bit of where's the next scrum. Yeah. But you just think, you do think about what's your next job. But yeah. it was a cagey sort of game. It wasn't. I imagine it wasn't a particularly good spectacle to watch. I haven't watched it all the way. It through. wasn't. It wasn't. It was probably nah. pretty dull. But you, sometimes you get great finals, but quite often these sort of games in all sports tend to be, because everyone knows what's at, right, at stake. Like... So it's, um, yeah, I, it, I remember key moments. And then I've, obviously I've seen them again in a game with like Mark Cueto's um, try, disallowed, not uh, not allowed. And I remember moments against back, it's both from players like that. It was raging. As, as usual, both of us. <laughs> and uh, it was just, I remember the, just the physicality of it. It was quite a physical game. They, they always are, as you yeah. played against South Africa. They, you've always got to have the eyes in the back of your head because there's some They're coming huge, from all different directions. Yeah, huge unit, unit just sort of taking off and smashing you in the ribs. Or, 
Um, so it was a, a physical, tough game. I felt like they had the edge, if I'm honest, at the time. It was a, so it wasn't a surprise that they they got the win in the end, even allowing for the uh, disallowed try. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Again, because I think because you aren't that emotional, you you take the emotion out and it just becomes real. Like when you play against South Africa, like you're exactly right. Like in terms of what you're saying, there is regardless of it, if it's a slower or a faster game. And again, when we look forward to this World Cup and the history that they've got, but it is that physicality, isn't it? It's that kind of gnarliness. It's that it doesn't need to be quick, but they're just so stuffy, like the kicking game, like they're big game players, you know? And I think you've just mentioned it there. Like, you know, back is both us, like your Victor Matfield. Like who was in the back row? Uh, you and Smith. 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 Yeah, you yeah, and Smith, who was brilliant. Uh, that day as well was Danny Rousseau, Short Burger, Short Burger, Scott Burger, of course. Yeah. yeah, like actually, when you look at them names, and you went on to play with some of them, didn't you? In, with with Backies, in, in how, hard, how hard's Backies? I think he's all blow. No, <laughs> I reckon. I don't tell him that he's. Uh, he'll have me now. I would. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it would win between Backies and Chabal in a fight. So back is back is both of them. versus Sebastian Chabal. Like in, in terms of scariness, like athleticism, but you've got to pick one. Like who would win? I don't know what we're deciding they're going to win. Let's just say a fight. <laughs> I would say back is um, he was because he was so he was so physical. We, we played against him. Yeah, a dog. Him. And he's dominated Jim. <laughs> oh, he has. I what I would say with him is that even when he the, the few occasions he does come off second best in a collision, he's not the sort of guy then. You know, shrinks in back. He'll just go again yeah. and again and again, and he's he's relentless. And he just um, he just seems to thoroughly enjoy trying to hurt people. <laughs> really, this is um, that was his thing mantra. You know, just physically dominate people, and that's why he's such an effective player and very effective at Toulon as well. Is Good bloke in, in that league. Good oh bloke yeah, off spent, the pitch. yeah, spent quite a long time, quite a lot of time with him. Just only coffees and things like that, but. Uh, um, yeah, good guy. While we're talking about guys off the pitch, we're going to talk about the Kempai 15. So right. I want you three best blokes for uh, having a beer with. They might have been opposition, they might have been teammates, but best guys to hang out with and have a beer with off uh, the pitch. Probably, um, well, I didn't actually spend time with it, but Scott Quinnell would be one. You remember? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, when I first turned professional, I was at Richmond, and he was at Richmond before he went back to the Scarlets. And I, but growing up, I was playing number eights. We've talked about before, and he was one of the first number eights you saw in rugby union in the mid nineties. He was really explosive, and and so I sort of admired him as a player. And then, um, as I say, didn't get an opportunity to play alongside him. But he was a guy who just seems to always have a huge amount of energy. So. I could be sitting. I think it would be good for a beer because I'd be sitting there moaning about the world, and you'd, he's the sort of bloke who'd just energize this, uh, energize everything. So, uh, well, if he couldn't get you up for a game as well, no one could. I would literally yeah, run through, run a, wall through a wall for that bloke. Yeah. When he talks, like some of the speeches, he has some of the greatest speeches ever. Sherry, if you're not crying when Scott Quinnell <laughs> does his speech, cry. then I'm, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm now, telling I think now, Scott Sherry Quinnell does could, not cry. I tell you now, <laughs> I reckon Scott Quinnell could make him cry. I reckon you get just a nod from Sherry knows. That's all you need. Yeah, yeah. I'm in. I'm zoned in. The second one, second player, yeah, Barry. Yeah. Stu, do you remember Barry? Yeah, Stu? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, played alongside him at uh, Sales, and he was just a good, good mate of mine, really. Yeah. And uh, uh, just a good, hardworking, good guy. We used to go off and do um, a brick lane course. The two of us. <laughs> nice. It's all for college. We yeah. used to do six hours a week of brick laying. Wow. And we, Put I that got, to good use? Not really. No, I built, <laughs> I built a barbecue and a couple of barbecues. And uh, But he actually was, uh, he got his, um, like a, what's it called? Advanced Construction Award. I only got yeah. my intermediate, but he passed with a distinction. So he was, a, he was just an interesting all round guy to, uh, and a good, good solid prop as well. Yeah. Like one of them guys, I imagine, that probably did, like you and him are just talking, but not talking about much, just, you know, letting the day go. Talking about scrum. Just, yeah, just the odd chat about scrum and just the odd nod. Yeah. So not just, a, there's no waffle with him, is there? It's just, no, no, no bollocks. It's just straight no, laced. No, no. But he, uh, he's had a nice demeanor about him. But yeah, no, we were probably quite similar in terms of uh, personalities in that in that respect. Right. Yeah. You've got to go number three. I can't number three. Sensing looseness or not. No, I don't think you no. want looseness. I don't think you I'd want I'd probably that. go for someone like, um, I've got to know him a little bit, uh, uh, Darnie Rousseau mm. at yeah. Toulon. Yeah. Um, I just liked him. He was just, he, he, uh, he was a tremendous player in his own right, but he obviously liked to, he liked to beer, 
or a whole case of them, I think. And he was uh, massively into his hunting. So he'd be a good sort of bloke. You could, he'd go off and do the hunting, bring the meat back, and then we'd have a few beers. And he was a, just a good, good all round guy. And um, he liked country music as well. So. Yeah. You're happy with yeah. that? Yeah. I need no, more what, Andrew Sheridan in my life. You, well, I'm upset. Oh. I'm what, upset. There's no bags. Yeah, of course why not. You, you talk why waffle. Why is too much? Though. I would have been a, I would have been a bag. I, I talk too much waffle. Like, as in, I would kill Sherry. If we were out on a hunting trip or something, you'd be like, mate, can you just shut, like, as in, will you just shut up? Like, I just He'd kill you. He'd I know he would. Yeah, yeah, he would. You said I would kill Sherry. Yeah, as in, with my banter oh, okay. and, and my too much chat. Country music. I like country music. Yeah. Yeah, big fan. It's, uh, oh, it's nice. It's got. He's been to tell a nice story. Yeah, nice. exactly that. I need more of that. I need more of that sort of music. I, I, are you into Stormzy and all that? Are you? No, no, no. <laughs> that, does that come as a big that, surprise? That's the backs. I'm sure he's not bothered that he's got me as a fan. I, I think know, he's doing all right. You know, look, he know, at least he knew him. He kind of. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah I recognise that. Sorry, go on. Should we have a look at <clears throat> this year's tournament and England's chances? Just yeah. get a kind of yeah. what your thoughts are on on where they are at the moment and their chances in the tournament. Well, Borthers was your old second row partner, wasn't yes. he? As we go back to the yeah. days, and you mentioned earlier about line outs, you didn't really like all the detail and the well, it, like. You've got it, the yeah. ultimate noise of line outs and coaching now, yeah. and you were the opposite. Just tell me what to do, and I'll fucking do it, kind of thing. Yeah. He was your partner for a, a long time, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm. I'm not surprised he's gone on, on to into the coaching setup, and it seems to be doing fr very well. And because he was so meticulous with everything he did, he was like, F detail, detail yeah. as a player. So he's just clearly taken that into the whole coaching setup. And uh, yeah, and it's great to see the other people from our sort of generation, people like Richard Wigglesworth, yeah. uh, doing well as, and Alex Sarnison at Sale. So it's, it's good to see these younger coaches coming through and doing well. But as far as England is concerned at the moment, they probably just need to get a bit more consistency. They're at the moment, as you know, it's France and Ireland are sort of up there, aren't they? And, um, but as we've talked about with 2007, with, with these guys now, they just need to get a bit of momentum and get through your group and then you're a couple of good performances away from a final. So I know after the warm-up game, everyone's against Wales, everyone's so slating them for the second half performance, but they're warm-up games, providing they get a bit of momentum in them. How many more have they got? The Three. Wales this week. And yeah, it's Three more, three, three, more, three more. Wales, Ireland, Fiji. As long as they can get some momentum, get their, the, you know, the, the players they want playing, the partnerships there, then they, they could be in a good position come the first game. Have they got Argentina? Yeah. First game, yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll be in a good position to, uh, on their side of the draw as well. The thing you never yeah. know, do you? No. And when you look at the makeup of the front row, Ellis Genge. Yeah. Yeah, I like uh, seeing all the uh, young players come through. Like, you know, Genge and Sinclair and people like this. And mm. As I said earlier, they, it's a slightly different. They seem to the the roles evolved a little bit, and they have to. They seem to be using these them as I wouldn't go as far to say playmakers, but they do seem oh, they to. to be, yeah. They do have to be in that in that pod, and they've got to make those decisions whether to, you know, pop it onto the next guy or or just hit it up or decoys and. So it's it's an interesting way the props have evolved. It's I always thought it might take a bit of from rugby league as in the props from rugby league and and there seems to be a little bit for rugby league influence more yeah. and more in terms of some of the sort of way people you're having to build tries and build opportunities in rugby union yeah. and now there's a guy obviously that plays the same position as you did but has a very different character to you sherry and i'm, I'm sure you know what i'm going to say now you're quite uh you know just get on with the work kind of thing work hard salt the earth bloke You've got Joe Marler, who is, look at me, I've got my tracksuit on, I've got my hair done, I'm trying to be a bit of a joke and a bit funny, but what a hell of a player as well. Yeah. Um, who are you picking at loose head for England to start if you were Steve Borthwick? Marler or Genge? And what do you think of Joe Marler? If it was a final, let's just base it as that. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think Genge, because he just brings a bit more you know, explosiveness. But, you know, Marler's a... He's had a fantastic career as well. He's still yeah. going strong. So um, I think there'll be decisions that both will take depending on the opposition, how strong, whether who who they consider to be the strongest scrummager. Um, you, you've, they've got to take in. There's so many variables, different factors you've got to take into account before making those sort of selections. Um, but I'd probably say Genge. There you go. Well, how about you? Uh, Genji. 
I don't know, actually. I might start Marla yeah. for scrums early on. Depends who it's against. And then but you can bring the Raging Genji off the... generally you, seen as the stronger scrummager. You I don't very, know. You tell uh, me. I've got no I, idea. I, yeah. I, I think Marla is the stronger scrummager. Oh. I, I think if you're looking at it solely on a final, and it's a big shout, because I love Genji, yeah. I think you, you'd look at Marla. Because you, I think statistically, and again, I don't know this, I'm kind of making it up, but from a scrummaging point of view, and let's have a think who it could be. So if you were playing a New Zealand, for example, who people think haven't got a good scrum, they've got a good scrum, yeah. or a South Africa who have a great scrum, or a France, or an Ireland, I think you'd go with Mahler and put Genji on the bench because you know what you're getting then off the bench. Mal, Mal Herb. Mal Herb. He looks like a heavy, straight. heavy looks like a bear. Bear. Do you still think about scrums like this? And like Not as much. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think more about wine and <laughs> <laughs> and weightlifting. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. trying not to get injured. And what are you doing now? What does life look like for Andrew it's Sheridan in the South pretty, of France? Pretty relaxed, to be honest. I'm not grafting like you boys. Mm. Um, He's done yeah. too well in his career. He doesn't need to. <laughs> No, so I just I, I did all my wine exams and uh, when I finished playing and I sort of do the occasional wine related event. Um but so yeah, I'm, I lead a quite a relaxed, sedate lifestyle. Not happy? Not, yeah, for yeah. Very happy. Mm. The yeah. same it. Like it, it sounds you know, there's actually I'm jealous of how chilled and kind of present you are. It's it's really cool. Well, I like to get back to uh, Wales as well, mid Wales, bit bit of time in London as well. So um, I was in Mid Wales because the Royal Ag Royal Welsh Show is cool, so we were there for yeah, that. Yeah, I like those actually. I take the kids yeah. to a few of those. Stay at me. Yeah, so, great, isn't it though? Yeah, the big big shows around there. So yeah, it's been been good. So no life, I can't complain. And that transition from playing, retiring, you yeah. obviously living. I, I, yeah. I hope you don't mind me saying you're living in the south of France. Everyone knows that. Yeah, an Englishman living in the south of France, a great pace of life. Y yeah. You found that because some people have found it quite hard transitionally, haven't they, mm. to ha have an identity. Yeah. And now, obviously, we're we're doing podcasting. I, yeah, I work in the city as well. But yeah. everyone tries to find another identity afterwards after they play. But you're just Andrew Sheridan living the life. Of, I mean, what yeah. a life, eh? Mm. Yeah, well, I, I don't. I haven't had that. Well, up to now, I've not had any problems with that sort of move away from rugby. Yeah, <clears throat> I had my time. Did, did my best. Um, don't have any regrets. Yeah. Um, I like to see other people doing well. So I like to look see other players coming through and the Eng Eng English players doing well. As I talked about coaches from particularly from our generation, I always like to see them doing well. So, yeah, um, I'm pretty happy with it. All, you any know. coaching aspirations or any like? Do you want to get um, back into the game at all? Or I, like I you, be a, the knowledge of scrums, you'd be unbelievable. Yeah, something that, uh, scrum or strength related, uh, but I wouldn't want to be spending hours and hours over looking at line outs yeah. <laughs> or, or any you know the, the amount of analysis that I think goes into the yeah. Uh, they put a huge number of hours in, don't they? I think these the coaches. Yeah. Um, you forget how much they do put in. Yeah. Don't they? Mm -hmm. So, but I've, I've I've done the odd scrummaging session with um, local clubs in France. And, but we'll life's see. good. We'll life see. sounds good, eh? Yeah. And how is it in France? The hysteria building for the World Cup is there talk of like the success that they need or want or pressures what's it well like? Dupont is everywhere you know? yeah he's which is still, great yeah he's it so they I mean how much how many euros he got in his bank account right well, rightly so <laughs> rightly yeah. so yeah he's a tremendous player oh, yeah he Ridiculous. really is mate but is there like are you sensing the pressure on the French team there I think it will start building now I've been been away for three weeks but I would imagine it's really ramping up mm. now it's because uh, it's a few you know a few of the matches are not too far from me in Marseille and Nice you so, get to a few We'll, I'll, I'll see. Might do. Yeah, <laughs> see, that's a, yeah. it's quite comfortable sitting and uh, watching it in yeah. the air conditioning. Yeah. Um, in the yeah. chateau, you got an England flag to drape outside the chateau. Oh, uh, chateau, chateau Sheridan. Got a chateau. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. I wouldn't go that. I wouldn't would do you, that. Brave no, I don't want to upset. The, I uh, would. Yeah, I know you would. But <laughs> are you supporting torched? England? Of course. Or you, yeah, 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 I've got. got I, I don't know what. I just thought I'd ask. You're in France now. You... Yeah, I have a lot, a lot of things to do with France and in the area we live in. But no, you don't lose your. I've got French residency, but I haven't got French nationality. Yeah. And what about the kids? Well, oh. I've got a daughter. Yeah, she's um, yeah, well, she would, she's not interested in rugby for a start. But, but if if it came to an England France final, oh, France, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, Sherry. Yeah, well, she's been there since she was two years old. She's not going to. I know. I know. You've got a, a Welsh wife. Sherry's one of the ultimate England rugby players, and then your daughter's stretching French. It, wow. No, I, in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion, wow, French. Okay. 
Yeah, but you, if you've grown up the whole... I know, yeah. You know, I, I get it. 13 now, so... It's, I yeah. just wouldn't let my kid do it. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair play. Yeah, no, that's class. All right, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate it. And enjoy the World Cup. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Been class. Cheers, Cheers mate. mate.